You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from theheart.org on Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for March 19th, 2021. This week... COVID, fish oil, SGLT2 inhibition, TAVR versus SAVR. In the United States, the burden of COVID continues to decrease. Hospitalizations are down, and the slope of the descent seems to be steepening, though one cautionary note is the state of Michigan, which has seen a rise in cases and hospitalizations. The European Union, however, is a different story. Cases are going up. My friend in France texted me, tells me that the COVID-related ICU admissions are increasing. Brazil, too, has increasing cases. And worse, some EU nations have paused vaccinations because of reports of clotting events after the AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, Twitter and media was awash this week with articles about correlation is not causation. In other words, you have to accept that there will always be a low-level baseline rate of clotting events in a population of millions of people who have received a shot. Now, whether the difference in the EU versus the U.S. COVID situation is due to vaccine rollouts or variants or just the stochastic nature of the virus, I do not know. But I do know that as this pandemic winds down, there will be a great tension in the dispersion of risk tolerances in society. My two bold predictions. One, our transition to an endemic SARS-CoV-2 is not going to be smooth. And two, in learning to live with the new respiratory pathogen, social media will be a net negative. Now, on the upside, my granddaughter went back to second grade this week. She was so happy to see her friends. It's still only two days per week, but this is progress. Okay, next topic, fish oil and AFib. This week, JAMA published the results of the Vital AF study, which enrolled 25,000 participants and studied the question of whether marine omega-3 fatty acids and or vitamin D reduced AFib incidence. Now, the type of fish oil in Vital AF was an EPA-DHA combination. Recall that in the Reduce It trial, it was just pure EPA. For the fish oil versus placebo comparison in Vital AF, incident AFib events occurred in 3.7 versus 3.4% of participants, respectively. The hazard ratio was 1.09 and 9% increase, but the confidence interval spanned from 0.96 to 1.24, and the p-value was non-significant at uh, 0.19. Now, similarly, in the vitamin D versus placebo arms, there was also no significant difference. A notable observation, however, on fish oil comes in the accompanying editorial from JAMA Deputy Editor, Dr. Greg Kerfman. Get this, he lays out a strong case that fish oil may actually increase, increase incident AFib. His argument centers on four different fish oil trials. First, in the strength trial, four grams per day of EPA DHA fish oil was compared with corn oil for the reduction of CV events. Now, CV events were not significantly different, but they observed a 69% increase in the risk of developing AFib in the fish oil group. It was 2.2% versus 1.3%, and this was a significant finding. In the Reduce It trial, 4 grams per day of purified EPA, called icosapent ethyl, was compared with mineral oil for the reduction of CV events. Now, the fish oil did reduce CV events by 25%, but there was a 35% increase in the risk of AFib with the fish oil compared with mineral oil, 5.3 versus 3.9%, and this was statistically significant. Third trial, in the OMENI trial of older patients who had a recent MI, 1.8 grams per day 
VPA DHA combination was compared to corn oil for cardiovascular events reduction. And again, there was no significant reduction in CV events. But again, AFib incidence was 84% higher, 7.2 versus 4.0% developed AFib. And that was almost significant, a p value of 0.06. Okay, so now you have three large RCTs as prior. Now consider the results of vital AFib, which I just told you had a 9% increased rate of AFib in the fish oil group compared with placebo. Now recall too that vital AF used far lower dose of fish oil, less than a gram per day. So on its own, this 9% increase in AFib and vital wasn't significant. But taking the evidence as a whole, Kerfman argues that fish oil may exert a dose-dependent increase in AFib incidence. I agree, I agree, and I have been de-prescribing fish oil in the clinic like crazy. In patients, unlike those enrolled in Reduce It, the vast majority of patients are on EPA, DHA. I encourage these patients to stop the pricey supplement. I tell patients to eat fish, not fish pills. This seems like a worthy slogan. Okay, next topic is the SGLT2 inhibitor ertaglivlosin and renal outcomes. Now, you all know I am quite positive on SGLT2 inhibitor drugs for the reduction of CV events in patients with diabetes, for the reduction in renal outcomes in patients with CKD and diabetes, and for the reduction of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalizations in patients with HFREF. Now, you also know there are numerous SGLT2 inhibitor drugs. There's AMPA and CANA and DAPA, etc. And when considered together, there sure seems to be a class effect. But that said, there will soon be great marketing pressure to use one or the other type of drug. I mean, our uh, pharmacy and therapeutics committee have had robust debates on which of the SGLT2 inhibitor drugs to have on our formulary. Okay, in December of 2020, a few months ago, New England Journal published a cardiovascular outcomes trial called Virtus CV. This was for the SGLT2 inhibitor drug ertaglifloxacin. Virtus CV enrolled patients who had diabetes and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. The primary objective of this experiment was to show non-inferiority of the drug ertaglifloxacin to placebo in the primary endpoint of MACE, CV death, stroke, or MI. The trial also had three glycemic substudies listed as primary objectives. Now, nearly the same rate of MACE occurred, and the upper bound of the hazard ratio was 1.11, and this was less than the non-inferiority margin of 1.2, so the drug met non-inferiority for cardiovascular outcomes. One of the secondary objectives was to look at the renal composite outcome of death from renal disease, dialysis or renal replacement therapy, or a doubling of the serum creatinine. This was the renal outcome that the trial is pre-specified in the trial protocol, and it was listed on clinicaltrials.gov. Now, they also listed 118 total secondary endpoints. I didn't misspeak there. I counted them. 118 secondary endpoints. In the main trial, the rate of this renal composite in patients who were in the active arm was 3.2%, versus 3.9% on placebo. This corresponds to a 19% reduction, hazard ratio 0.81, but the 95% confidence intervals range from 0.63 to 1.04, or said another way, the 95% confidence intervals range from a 37% reduction in renal outcomes to a 4% increase in risk of renal outcomes. Now, since the upper bound passed 1.0, this reduction is not felt to be statistically significant. Not only that, but since the first key secondary outcome in Virtus was CV death and heart failure hospitalizations, and this was not statistically significant, quote, in accordance with the pre-specified hierarchical testing procedure, further statistical testing of other secondary outcomes was not performed. But now, now, the journal Diabetologia, I have trouble saying that, has published a new analysis of the data from Virtus CV investigators. For this analysis, the authors used a different renal composite endpoint. I hope you're all getting a little bit nervous. For this report, they swapped out the time to doubling of creatinine and swapped in 
a sustained 40% reduction from baseline EGFR into the renal composite secondary endpoint. And voila, now using this new composite of renal death, renal replacement therapy, and a 40% EGFR reduction, the event rates were 6% versus 9%, hazard ratio was 0.66 with confidence intervals that range from 0.5 to 0.88, which is a much larger effect size with tighter confidence intervals. Now, the authors write, all analyses reported here were pre-specified either in the statistical analysis plan of the trial or in a separate analysis plan completed prior to the database lock and unblinding. Now, keep in mind that the renal outcome was a secondary endpoint. And they also pre-specified 118 other secondary endpoints. So this new paper is a reanalysis of a secondary endpoint with a swapped-in different endpoint. In the paper, the authors cite many reasons why a 40% reduction in EGFR is a reasonable endpoint. For instance, other similar trials have used this measure. Okay, I get that, but I still find this a very dubious analysis. As it is, a secondary endpoint is considered exploratory. Now you have an exploratory reanalysis of an exploratory endpoint. I don't think this is p-hacking because I don't think the researchers performed hundreds of different comparisons and picked ones that were statistically significant. With more than 100 secondary endpoints, this seems more like degrees of freedom. Statistician Andrew Gelman calls this the Garden of Forking Pass. And the mistake, he writes, is in thinking that if the particular path that is chosen yields statistical significance, that this is strong evidence in favor of the hypothesis. Now, my main point in discussing this reanalysis is not to dismiss the potentially beneficial effects of urticoplosin on renal outcomes. You can see this from the original hazard ratio and the 95% confidence intervals that span from 0.66 to 1.04. That's likely a true effect. But I want to oppose in the strongest terms an after-the-fact or post-hoc reanalysis of the data with a different endpoint swapped in. The authors cover themselves because they describe the problem with post-hoc analyses in the limitations paragraph, but this doesn't stop them from concluding, quote, among individuals with type 2 diabetes and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, ertagliflozin reduced the risk for the pre-specified exploratory composite renal endpoint. My friends, here is the problem with this. A major diabetes journal has published it. It's peer-reviewed. So, there will be reprints and PowerPoints and info cards can be made with this more impressive risk reduction in renal outcomes. These marketing devices can then be shown in medical expos at future meetings and along with burritos in unsuspecting doctor's offices. It oversells the evidence and this is not a good thing. Next topic is transcatheter aortic valve replacement versus surgical aortic valve replacement for patients with AS, TAVR versus SAVR. This is one of the hottest topics in cardiology right now, and the heart.org Medscape Cardiology features a 20-minute discussion between two experts in TAVR and SAVR, interventional cardiologist Wayne Batchelor and surgeon Tom Wynn. I highly recommend the video. They discuss many of the issues surrounding this decision. This includes a brief synopsis of the trial data, discussions on bicuspid valve, valve iterations, long-term valve durability, and a super relevant discussion about heart team approach and the tension between interventional cardiologists and surgeons. Dr. Wynn, surgeon, mentioned the catch-up phenomenon in the Partner 3 Low Surgical Risk Aortic Stenosis TAVR versus SAVR trial. That is, at one year, the results strongly favored TAVR, but then the curves for the primary endpoint of stroke, death, and hospitalization started coming together at two years. Now, I've discussed this topic before, but because it's such a relevant, everyday thing, it's worth a brief review. First, I consider myself an unbiased, neutral observer. I don't do either procedure. I refer patients for aortic valve replacement. I do see a lot of these patients, though, because of the electrical issues after these cases. Second, I think TAVR has been an amazing technology, especially for older and intermediate to higher risk patients, and the valve is still iterating and getting better. But here are eight things that worry me about the rapid acceptance of TAVR in younger, lower risk patients. First, Partner 3 was the only trial using hospitalizations in the primary endpoint. All others used stroke and death. 
adding hospital admissions in the primary endpoint was highly dubious because it biased in the short term against surgical aortic valve replacement. No explanation has been given for this outlier. At the European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery meeting in the fall of 2020, I asked the trialist about this. He shrugged his shoulders and offered because FDA allowed it. Second concern, relative to the number of primary endpoint events in the medium and high-risk TAVR versus SAVR trials, there have been smaller numbers of heart endpoints in the lower-risk trials. Fewer events means more uncertainty. For instance, 90% of the Evolute low-risk data was imputed. At the time that the trial was published, only 10% of the patients had had two years of follow-up. Third concern, if you include both types of transcatheter valves, the self-expanding and balloon expanding, there is a higher rate of pacemakers with TAVR. Now, this is less of an issue in older patients, but a huge issue in younger patients. Surgeon Dr. Joseph Bavaria has shown data from the real-world STS registry that the rates of pacing after TAVR has not decreased appreciably in the last few years. Fourth concern, Bavaria also shows from the same registry that what he calls TAVR disasters have not decreased significantly over time. Fifth concern, in Partner 3, the rate of left bundle branch block was more than twofold greater in TAVR, 20% versus 9%. Left bundle branch block is not a good thing to give to younger patients. Sixth concern, in Partner 3, the rate of valve thrombosis was 2.6% in TAVR versus 0.7% in SAVR. This could influence anticoagulation decisions and, again, is a bigger deal in younger patients. Whenever you look at longer-term data, TAVR is trending worse. In the intermediate risk group, the five-year results of Partner 2, just including the transfemoral cohort, the Kaplan-Meier curves for stroke and death after two years are seriously diverging against TAVR. And a meta-analysis of six TAVR versus SAVR trials from Borrelli et al., which I will link to, finds a time-varying effect on mortality. TAVR is related to better survival in the first months after implantation, whereas after 40 months, it is a risk factor for all-cause mortality. Now, open heart surgery is clearly a bigger deal in the short term. Many patients would still choose TAVR even with a slightly higher rate of death or stroke at five years, but not all patients would. And as Dr. Batchelor and Dr. Wynn highlight, a thorough discussion with patients is crucial. And I can't help but think that in a perfect world, there would be a role for a neutral party who is pretty good at evidence review involved in this discussion. So that's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you. And remember, if you like this podcast, it really helps to give us a review or rate us. That way others can find us. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org on Medscape.